There's a movie out there that's trying to inspire people to fight against the evil people that are targeting children and doing all types of evil things. And while that fight is well worth it and certainly a important fight, it's nowhere near the biggest fight. The biggest fight today is for your soul. And in fact, many people don't even realize that it's up for grabs. The fight for your soul is sometimes being fought by people that you think are your friends, your teachers, your colleagues, and even family members. And if a person doesn't realize that they're in the fight, it's usually because they've already lost part of it. Tonight, the Chazonish is going to teach us and inspire us how to fight for our soul. An inspiration unlike any other. If you're going to watch this lecture, you're probably going to be inspired to do a whole lot more than what you're doing with something that perhaps you haven't paid as much attention to. Enjoy the lecture, share it, be inspired, let us know when you are, and most importantly, be holy. We are back here starting a new week, a week where we have uh, the uh, big day of Tisha B'Av, uh, this is a week that's uh, very different than the rest of the weeks of the year. Uh, Bezat Hashem will uh, spend some more time uh, discussing it a little bit today, but more so later on uh, this week, on Tuesday and Wednesday, Bezat Hashem. <coughs> Tonight's you is a uh, part of the Jewish Ashkafa series, and it's going to be for the Refuash uh, Lemayin Atzlacha Rabba for Rav Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara, Bat Anat, Tinok ben Sara. Rabbanit Levana bat Sara, Avi Mori David ben Esria, Imi Morati Doris bat Jora, Sara bat Esther, and also a couple of people that uh, wanted me to think about them when I uh, mentioned the Shio but not mentioned their names. And uh, also for anybody that uh, continues to sponsor our Shioim, continue to uh, help us with all the wonderful things that the organization is doing. Uh, Hashem will bless you and uh, all that you love and all those that love you. Uh, if anybody that wants uh, to uh, be mentioned in the Shurim for Refuah Shlema, for and really the biggest thing is to be partner in all the amazing things that the organization is doing as uh, being a sponsor of one of these Shurim or a series of them, uh, you could simply go to our website, bezratashem.org. There's uh, in the store over there, there's several different options of sponsorship. And uh, we uh, are always happy to have uh, more new sponsors that help us do all the things that we're doing. Uh, if you are in uh, Miami or in the South Florida area, I'm sure you've probably seen our uh, um, Kiruv station, as it's uh, really surprising a lot of people and making a lot of people happy. If you've seen some of the more uh, recent short videos we're getting from there. A lot of uh, people from all walks of life are uh, simply amazed and uh, crazy about this uh, new Kiruv station that's been there for the last month and a half or so, where our guys are uh, set up over there with a bunch of books and tzitziot and uh, a lot of other things that are, uh, you know, very expensive, but everything's free. Uh, literally, it's a uh, changing uh, people's perspective of the world of Torah. And Baruch Hashem, some of them have contacted us saying thank you. Some uh, Baruch Hashem are, uh, have decided to contribute a little bit. So this Kiruv station is certainly something that uh, is uh, waking up a lot of people. People that, uh, you know, simply didn't, uh, didn't know that uh, such a thing exists. <clears throat> so Baruch Hashem for that. organization for the piece of farm they've given me. I've already read one of them, the Halachos of Kibra Ve'im, and it was very helpful in how my and my friend's relationship and understand and be able to be more respectful towards them. And now I'm getting Hilcho Shabbos to teach me how to properly keep Shabbos in a more, you know, more Kavana and with more knowledge and able to fully manage. Yeah. 
Anybody that wants to do a little Kirov station of their own in, uh, you know, wherever they are in the United States can order some of our uh, books in the uh, Kirov store, all for free, of course, same price. Uh, and uh, for any of you that are ordering the books or the CDs or the USBs for the sake of selling them, just so you know, you're considered 100% a thief. Uh, because we are obviously the ones that are paying for them, not for you to, and giving to you for free, not for you to sell them and make money, but rather for you to give it out to Jewish people so they can read them, so they can listen to them, so they can get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So if you're doing it for the sake of uh, making money, like unfortunately a few people have done with some of our stuff, where they're listing it on eBay and uh, different places, then just so you know, in Shemaim you're considered 100% a thief. For any of you that are looking to help people uh, and take advantage of this offer, you can go to our Kiruv store. It's kiruvstore.org, K-I-R-U-V, store.org. And uh, you can get some of these books for free. We have a new book that's out for the last few days. This is Rabbi Frime's new book. Uh, it's really uh, five books in, or six books in one. Uh, six major topics. Uh, and it's really for uh, people that uh, it's only in Hebrew. Uh, and it's really for people that are at all levels, whether you're extremely uh, observant and a Talmud Chacham and you have some halachic uh, tshuvot in there, or you're brand new and you need some basics of uh, how do I prove that there's a God and where was God during the Holocaust type of questions. These are all mentioned here. And of course, the very well known and uh, uh, simply uh, uh, shocker for a lot of people, the uh, Kuntres Genom is also in here. So this is in our store. Each box has 32 books. Uh, each person can get a uh, box. If you have a lot of people, you can get more than one box. Just contact us, or you could simply go to the Kiruv store to get some of these, as well as my book. Uh, the books are in uh, Hebrew. The USBs are English. So uh, that's uh, something that you can look into. So with that being said, let's uh, go into the uh, holy torah and try to uh, find ourselves in there find our situation in there find our generation in there uh, but i must uh, uh, remind any of you that haven't uh, watched uh, the uh, new podcast that uh, we released last night with uh, our dear friend and talmid arye uh, ben israel where uh, he tells you uh, parts of his life story and Arya's story is, uh, you know, although unique, it's not unique, meaning that it's unique, of course, his own uh, story is extraordinary, but as he himself says, there are literally thousands and thousands of Jewish people just like him that grew up in a Frum home, uh, sometimes a Hasidish home, sometimes a Litvish, sometimes Sephardic, uh, all types of uh, Frum homes out there, but uh, got off the derech fell off the derech, but not because of his own dislikes uh, of the Torah or chas v'shalom, his dislikes of Hashem, but rather because of bad teachers, bad teachers, bad rabbis, bad people that uh, simply uh, looked at the, uh, at the wallet instead of looking at the neshama uh, and uh, looked at the, uh, you know, at the, uh, at the image rather than looking at the... Uh, <coughs> The part of a Kadosh Baruch Hu that's inside every single Jew and every single person, quite frankly. Uh, of course, there's a very big difference between the Jew and the non-Jew. But it's needless to say, the uh, when uh, you have a bad teacher, it doesn't really make a difference whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. That bit, bad teacher can destroy a lot of people. And uh, I heard that there is a uh, movie out there, not that I'm recommending for anybody to watch any movies whatsoever, but simply the story itself is a, a shocker to many of how there is a, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of evil people in the world, especially uh, people in power, that are uh, kidnapping children and uh, doing all of the worst possible things that you can imagine with those kids. And it's become a multi-billion dollar business. And uh, there are some decent people out there that are trying to fight it. And this whole uh, movie is about the story of this 
uh, one individual that uh, you know is trying to save some of these kids. And the reason why I'm even mentioning this is because certainly there are destroyers of lives that are people are familiar with, like this movie is about. But there are also destroyers of lives that are sometimes people that get a salary for it, people that are uh, you know, leaders of a yeshiva or leaders of a class, public school, private school, doesn't really make much of a difference. There are unfortunately many destroyers out there. And if a parent uh, does not pay careful attention to who is teaching their kids and what they're teaching them, uh, then uh, by the time you find out that your kid was destroyed, it may very well be too late. Aryeh was a uh, one of the fortunate ones where... Uh, after almost 25 years, he finally was able to save himself. Uh, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't easy, and it certainly wasn't a, uh, you know, a, uh, something that happened quickly. And this is really one of the things that the Chazonish has uh, elaborated on and will elaborate further on today, <coughs> really about who to learn from. Last week, you know, he discussed... Uh, how it's important for you to know who you're learning from and to make sure that you know that when the Gemara says in Masechet Moed Katan and in several other places that you need to learn from people that have good midot, that have good character traits. You have to learn from people that are themselves following the Torah completely because if they're an avaryan, avaryan is someone that's uh, in the street language considered a criminal, in the uh, holy language, it's considered a criminal, but a different type of criminal, a criminal against the Torah. Uh, so someone that's an avaryan, someone that is uh, bringing people to sin, such as uh, you know, bringing them to uh, a beach uh, to go pray, even though they know very well that there's going to be a, mod- a bunch of immodest people uh, walking around, which you're not allowed to go to such a place, but he's bringing them to such a place to go pray because he thinks that that's going to get more of the congregants to come pray. Or he makes an event in the synagogue of a casino, which is forbidden according to the Torah, according to all opinions. Not only is it forbidden to gamble, but it's literally a chilul Hashem to have these events, these so-called casino events inside these uh, synagogues. And uh, and in so many words, uh, tell people that, yeah, listen, you gamble here, you gamble there, this one's going at Staka, in uh, the synagogue, this one is going to stuck in your uh, pocket. So these types of things, unfortunately, have become uh, blurried in the eyes of uh, some people. And unfortunately, some of those people are board members in synagogues. And uh, the destruction of the generation continues simply because if people don't do what Arya did for himself and many of our Talmudim did for ourselves, which is literally to just grab the Torah and find out what the truth is, Uh, listen to the truth and run away from lies, then unfortunately they could literally live their entire lives being affected and infected by these false teachers that misguide people, people that invite Christian missionaries to a, you know, to a Orthodox synagogue saying that this is a uh, a way to make peace among the nations, among the, uh, the religions. Obviously these things are completely forbidden, but it's become normalized by a few bad leaders to the point where unfortunately some people don't see a problem there people don't see there being a problem with giving out their own commentary on a torah that contradicts our sages they don't see a problem in having a fashion show inside a synagogue inside a yeshiva they don't see a problem in bringing all types of people with questionable preferences, let's just say that, uh, you know, to be their speakers or to be their comedians, as we spoke about last week. So it's very, very important for you to educate yourself and not put yourself in somebody else's hands. So the Chazonish here is reminding us that sometimes when you have a bad teacher, at first, it may not be apparent because he looks like a good teacher He looks like uh, an elder. He looks like he is well-spoken. He looks like he has some accomplishments. He has written some books. He has uh, a lot of subscribers on the internet in this generation. For some reason, people think that many subscribers means, uh, uh, you know, uh, actual uh, righteousness. Uh, He has a, uh, you know, so-called following. So the key is to understand that 
looks can be deceiving. And it's important to know that you cannot judge a book by its cover. You have to look at what's inside. And once that teacher speaks, whether he be a rabbi or a rebbitzin or any other type of teacher, if you are knowledgeable, you will be able to know whether that teacher is righteous or wicked. But if you're not knowledgeable, then your blood is in your own hands, meaning it's not even just the fault of the teacher because he's simply a shark and you can't be angry at a shark for eating somebody. It's your fault for putting yourself in the hands of your own ignorance. So needless to say, each person gets their punishment, but you have a solution and the solution is to educate yourself. But when it comes to the educator himself, says the Chazonish that this educator that has these bad character traits, that is constantly distorting the Torah, that is, you know, horrible in, in, in different ways, this educator is going to create students just like him. Not only because they're listening to him, but when he presents himself, he presents himself as if he is the model of perfection, an example of all good qualities. And all of the regrettable actions that he does are done with such pride and arrogance that his students would adopt these delusions and behave abominably while believing that their actions are the purest of pure. Meaning, these types of leaders create not only victims that have literally the rest of their lives to cry, but also victims that become predators themselves. You know, it's not a, uh, a, a very uh, um, common topic uh, for people to, add, to, to talk about, but when it comes, to, for example, uh, to the topic of, of uh, pedophiles, uh, many, uh, many times the pedophile... Uh, was someone that was, uh, you know, that was uh, raped himself. Uh, you know, so he, what he does to other people is what was done to him. Uh, you know, and, and it's a, uh, see, this is something that uh, a lot of people may not realize, but what people usually do to others that's evil is typically their outburst of what was done to them and how that particular trauma uh, numb them to a certain extent as part of the trauma, but also as, as part of their so-called revenge or, or psychological disorder that they've developed as a result of it, they lash out on others. So the same concept goes with people that are, uh, you know, are taught by evil people, by people that are uh, simply uh, heretics. Uh, you know, those people many times become heretics themselves uh, that mislead the public. And uh, you're actually seeing it, uh, quite frankly, you're seeing it happen online as we speak. Over the last couple of years, some of the people that we've exposed that are famous uh, or infamous heretics have developed Talmidim. Not just Talmidim in the public, regular average people, but even other rabbis are following their footsteps. 20, 30 years they've been teaching, they've never said a single thing that is even relevant to the heresy being taught of God needs you. And all of a sudden they have this new chidush that God needs you and God has needs and he has uh, you know, all types of uh, desires and all types of things that are obviously the opposite of our Torah. How come if you thought this and you knew this and this is true, why didn't you men this, mention this during the first 15 or 20 years that you've been teaching or 30 years that you've been teaching? So obviously they see the success of some of the other evil people that I'm mentioning it, and they're figuring, listen, uh, let's follow in the footsteps of success rather than the footsteps of truth. So the educator himself is presenting whatever evil he's doing with pride, with arrogance, so much so that his victims think that this is good. And such an educator will produce pupil in his image, and likeness, and if an educator has none of the wisdom of a Torah gained from the laboring in the study of halacha, and therefore fails in the realm of respecting and obeying Torah scholars of halacha, 
he passes on the same heritage to his pupils. So this particular segment is the end of segment of, of uh, the section 16, but it's really important for a person to know that one of the things that you can see as a common denominator among these heretics is that they disregard halacha and they disregard other opinions of much greater rabbis than they can ever be uh, alike, meaning one disregards them and so do the other ones and the other ones. And you mentioned, yeah, but listen, Rav Moshe Feinstein said the opposite and the Leshem said the opposite and Rav Avadia said the opposite and everyone said the opposite. Yeah, yeah, no, but but we heard this from Rabbi so-and-so. Yeah, but but he's not even enough to be their, 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 the footsteps of their shoes. What are you talking? How could you compare? No, he's been a rabbi for many years. I'm sure he knows what he's talking about. And it completely disregard the opinions of Gdole Olam, of the giants of the generation. And it's what happens here. The teacher disregards it, the student disregards it. And of course, the teacher distorts reality, the students distort reality. Now in segment number uh, 17, or section 17 in chapter 4, the Chazonish continues, and he goes a segue into something else before he comes back, in essence, to an elaboration of the same point. And he says the follows, The spirit of man, the nefesh, is broader than the sea, containing endless lights, constantly thinking and weighing matters logically, Indeed, most of its forces will not be utilized in a practical way due to fundamental inhibitions lying at the base of the combination of a soul and a corporal body. So here in his first part, he's going into a world that many are completely oblivious to, don't understand, and even if they heard it, they simply do not comprehend the capacity. And that is the nefesh adam, the soul of a person. Now, as our sages teach us, there are five different parts that can be part of a uh, of, of the soul of a person. In English, they summarize it as just simply soul. But there is five different parts. There is the nefesh, neshama, ruach, chaya, and yechida. Yechida is only something that Mashiach will have. Most people just have nefesh. Sometimes they have nefesh and neshama, and some that are very holy also have ruach. Now, chaya and yechaya is really um, major exceptions, uh, you know, in, in the generation. But the point being is, is that everybody has that basic. And that's in essence what the Chazunish is talking about. That's the nefesh. That nefesh is something that every human being has. And here the Chazunish is telling us that this nefesh, this spirit of man, has light within it that is broader than the sea. Literally endless lights, endless capacity. Now, the average person hears this, yeah, you have a, the sky is the limit for you. Any average person, can, you know, usually has a uh, something physical that they could uh, measure that against. So we tell them, sky is the limit. They're like, oh yeah, well, I can make a lot of money. And even that, a lot of money is defined differently by different people. Some people think that a lot of money is a uh, million dollars. Some people don't think that a lot of money is a billion dollars. A lot of money is different for different people. And usually, whatever you think is a lot of money, your full potential is typically about 40% of that, uh, of what you're able to get yourself to, not necessarily what you can do. But usually people stop at about 40% of whatever they think is a lot. The same concept if you uh, talk to them about, you know, the, the, their physical ability. You know, if they uh, say that sky is the limit, then, you know, they compare it to whatever physical endeavor they're in, whether it be swimming or running or jumping or, or, uh, or anything else that involves the body. They compare it to that. But really what the Chazunish is talking about is not the physicality and not your, uh, your business endeavors, but rather the capacity of the soul, which is can literally 
has lights within it, can create light, can create an impact on the world where what you say can be created, where what you think can come to life in such a way that a person that utilizes even one more percent of their brain than the next person can literally make a significance between the two of them of 20 to 50 percent of if not even a hundred percent because most people do not use very much of their brain very much of their uh spirit that they actually have in them because they are limited not limited because of their ability but limited because of different things that are holding them back and these things that are inhibiting them from, from, from getting to where they need to be are not necessarily always self-inflicted. Sometimes you have the lack of confidence that a person has where you tell them, listen, you know that uh, you may not be keeping Shabbat right now, you may not be protecting your breath right now, but you can do it. No, no, it's too hard for me. I have... You know, I have to check my phone and I have to, you know, see this and I have to see that and protect my breeds too hard. No, no, for sure you can do that and much more. Well, how do you know? Simple. That's what you were created for. When a Kadosh Baruch Hu created you, he created you with that in mind. Le'avdil, just like when, you know, they created the, uh, the invented the, uh, the, the, the phone. They invented that phone to make calls. Later on, they innovated that same phone to also have the ability to go on the internet, to send messages, to to, to look at pictures, to take pictures. So if I told you that that phone can take pictures, that phone can uh, can go on the internet, and you're going to tell me, well, how do you know? Simple. That's what it was made for. That's what it was made for. Now, so long as it's still working and it has the energy in it, it's what it's made for. Sometimes it needs a little extra charge in order for it to do what you want it to do. But after it gets that charge, so long as all the parts work, it could certainly do that because that's what it was made for. The same concept with you. You may not realize that you can keep all of the mitzvot, that you can put on a tzitzit, that you can protect your eyes and not look at things that are inappropriate and immodest, that you could be modest yourself, that you are a bat Israel and you're married to a man, so therefore you should cover your head with a mitpachat and not with another uh, woman's hair on your head because covering your hair with a hair simply does not uh, change anything. Quite frankly, I never understood the logic behind it. If your goal is to look like a married woman, then how could somebody know that you're a married woman if your hair is covered with hair? But the point being is, is that you can do it. Yeah, but nobody else does it in my community. That doesn't make a difference. That shouldn't stop you. That's not necessarily something that's holding you back. I mean, that's you holding yourself back because you're afraid of perhaps what people are going to say. You're afraid of how people are going to look. But... Really here, the biggest inhibitor is you. You are stopping yourself, whether it be lack of confidence. But that's why you need different shilim, different lectures, different videos, different books to discuss it, to give you that boost, to give you that energy. Just like that phone needs that energy boost from the electric socket. Well, it's certainly better to get an energy boost from... The, uh, the rabbi is giving you a video or, or, or talking about it in a lecture, then getting an electric uh, shock in Gainom for not following. So sometimes our biggest inhibitor of things is ourself. And that's certainly true in most cases. <clears throat> but sometimes, <clears throat> when somebody's really already on a good path, they've already decided to leave the army of the Satan, start observing mitzvot, start keeping Shabbat, start keeping Ta'at Mishpacha, start keeping modesty, start doing things. The Satan doesn't like it. And therefore, he sends you some bigger tools, some bigger weapons to fight against you. And then he sends different friends and family 
and even sometimes rabbis that are going to tell you, what are you doing? Why are you modest? Why are you dressed like this? You look like a grandmother. You look like uh, you're from uh, the uh, 1800s. Why are you, uh, you know, why are you going to shul? You should go to the pool instead. It's a nice day. Barely anybody there at the, at the beach. Why don't you go over there? And he sends you different people to misguide you, to mislead you. And these little Amalekim are sometimes the people that are the closest to you. And the Satan specifically sends them because he knows it works. Now, had you known how powerful your soul is and how much light it creates as a result of you overcoming these obstacles, you would never even consider it. You would never even consider falling for these traps. You would simply cleave on to that light and never let go because you'd want more light. And even more so, if some bad teacher came to you and told you, listen, what are you doing? You're rebuking people? Who are you to rebuke? Don't you know that there is a, a one of the Chachamim in the Gemara says that there's a, you can't rebuke anymore? Don't you know that there's no more rebuke? Now, this very often comes from someone that calls himself a rabbi. Now, of course, once that rabbi said that, he's no longer considered a rabbi, according to the halacha, according to the Torah, because he just removed one of the mitzvot in the Torah. We have 613 mitzvot in the Torah. One of them is ocheach tocheach et amitecha. You must rebuke your fellow. When you see your fellow doing something against the Torah, you have to rebuke them. Now, when that rabbi said, there is no more rebuke, he just removed one of those mitzvot and he's considered... 100% 100% a heretic. Even more so, once he did that, when he saw somebody else is doing it, he's actually trying to fulfill the mitzvah, and he's telling him not to do it, this is no different than seeing somebody fasting on Yom Kippur, or going to synagogue and praying on Shabbat and observing Shabbat, or uh, you know having a little seder on Pesach, and telling him, nah, why are you doing that? Why are you eating matzah on Pesach? Why are you fasting on Yom Kippur at Tisha B'Av? Don't do it. Why? It's not needed anymore. This is not, this is not different at all. Why? This is removing a mitzvah. This is removing a mitzvah. Now this usually happens to people that have even more light than the average. Meaning, the more light you have, the more ability you have to help other people, the more powerful the weapons that the satan will send you and this happens unfortunately not just to older people that have done tshuva watching some of our shurim but even to younger kids that don't even know we exist young kids that are in yeshiva that want to learn more want to learn extra but their rabbi says no 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 don't learn extra just learn what we're learning yeah, but I learned everything we're learning, and I, and I passed the class, so I want to learn some more Gemara because, no, oh, no, don't do it. Don't do it. And I've heard, unfortunately, situations like this where young kids that started taking on more learning on their own were being told by the rabbis that they shouldn't be learning extra. Just learn what the, what the yeshiva is learning. So, if a person understood the capacity of their neshama, they wouldn't listen to anybody. Now the Gaon Vilna says that when a person goes up to Shemaim, they're going to be judged. But they're not going to be judged simply for what they did wrong. They're going to be judged for what they missed out on. Din v'cheshbon. The Gaon Vilna gives a scary explanation where he says, when a person makes a sin and causes a damage on their soul, that's not the only thing that they're going to have to pay. But they're also going to have to pay for what happened as a result of you making that sin. Now, you made that sin and you caused, let's say, for example, you caused the person to not keep Shabbat anymore. Or you yourself violated Shabbat. And instead of going to 
pray on Shabbat, have Kiddush on Shabbat, you went to the beach on Shabbat, you uh, were playing on a computer on Shabbat. Now there's the calculation, the calculation of how much time you've spent on that other sin that could have been spent learning Torah. How much damage was caused as a result of you not fulfilling that mitzvah. And worse, worse yet, the damage that a person cannot even quantify is that how much did you enjoy that sin? Meaning not only did you sin, not only did you use the time that you were supposed to make a mitzvah for making sins, but you even enjoyed the sin. For that is a separate payment for. So the Gaumi Vilna brings us a little bit more perspective of what happens when we turn off the light. And says the Chazonish, no one under the sun has fulfilled his obligation to make full use of his unknown powers. And yet there is no one who does not have within himself the energy that forces him to do something. Some have tremendous energies to the point point of their never being able to rest or slumber. So here he's telling us, no one out there has used this full potential. The neshama that you have has such extraordinary potential that you have no concept of how much you can do. You think that you could maximum learn 15 minutes a day. If you get an hour, it's already a miracle. But in reality, Hashem created you with the neshama that could literally become the gdola do, that could study for 18 to 22 hours per day for the next 80 years. You have a neshama of a gdola do. You have a neshama of someone that can bring light to every single corner in the world. Right now, you think that you simply have a tiny little candle that might be able to light the little table, maybe even the room. Akadosh Baruch Hu that created you says, what room? What are you talking about room? You are the one that I sent to the world to light entire countries with the holiness of Torah that you can teach. And when a person does not realize that, they'll be sued for it in Shemai. A woman can have a fantastic marriage that could lead her to Gehenom. How could such a thing be? She has a marriage. She married. She's Jewish. He's Jewish. They had little Jewish kids. Everything is wonderful. She sends her husband to go work. He works. He's a doctor. He's a lawyer. He's a, I don't know, accountant. He's an entrepreneur of some kind. And she likes how they're living life and they're going up the corporate ladder. They're going up the financial ladder. They're doing well. The kids are going to yeshiva. They're getting a decent education. But she forgot to send our husband to also go learn a couple of hours a day. And when he told her, listen, Ani, I'm going to go to a shiur Torah on Tuesday night. She said, what? Tuesday? No, no. Tuesday night I have uh, dinner with my friends. You have to watch the kids. Oh, okay. All right, I'll watch the kids. And then the following day comes up. And he says, okay, honey, listen, there's another shiur by uh, Rabbi Reuven. I'm going to go watch it with a few friends. No, what, what? Wednesday night, it's our date night. Oh, yeah, 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 no, no. My bad. Okay, fine, no problem. Yeah, yeah. Where, where do you want to go tonight? No, I want to go to that new steakhouse. I want to go to that new steakhouse. They have uh, some, uh, some good food there. Okay, no problem. We're going to go to the steakhouse. And the next week comes up. They go, oh, honey, listen, I'm going to go learn some dafyomi. With the uh, rabbi. What daf yomi? What are you talking about? We have to still fix what happened over the weekend. The house is a mess. I can't do this by myself. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. And the next day comes out. He goes, honey, do you think I can go to the shield tonight? 
I don't know, if you want to leave your, your wife alone in the house, sad and miserable, and I have nothing to do or anyone to talk to because all the kids are gone, if you think that's okay, then yeah, just leave me. Sure, I'll, I'll just cry by myself. No, no, chas v'shalom, I'd never leave you. Let's talk. What do you want to talk about? Well, you know, I really do want to talk about where we're going to vacation this summer. And she has a wonderful marriage. A marriage that will land her inside Genom. And who knows if she'll ever come out of. Why? She forgot the purpose of life is not the girlfriends and the dinners. It's not the cleaning the house. But rather, it's to make sure that our husband and kids are going to learn to her. She wanted to talk. She's going to regret every single word. Why? The purpose of the wife is to make sure to send kids and the husband to go learn Torah. In fact, the Gemara says, what is an Eshet Chayil? What is an Eshet Chayil? Is an Eshet Chayil someone that cooks and cleans? Like a cleaning lady and a, and a professional chef? No. In fact, even if she doesn't cook and she doesn't clean, she could still be an Eshet Chayil. So long as she raises his kids with Torah and she helps him whatever way he needs to go learn Torah and she makes sure he doesn't sin and they're together, she's an Eshet Chayil, says the Tanaim. They never say anything about cooking and cleaning. Surely it's good if she cooks and cleans. But even if she's a professional chef, every day she cooks him a five-course meal. And the house is so clean, you can see your reflection on the floor. If she doesn't make sure he goes to learn Torah, she has a very serious problem in Shemaim. Why? That's your job in the world. Now she says, yeah, but I tried to send him, and he doesn't want to go. I told him, here, here's a shoe by the rabbi. He doesn't like it. And that's it? You tried and you finished? That's, that's it? Let me ask you something. When you wanted to go, to go visit your parents in uh, the end of the world of where they live, and it was going to cost about 50% more than you could afford, and your husband said no, and you cried for three days straight until he said yes, did you cry the same way when you didn't want to go to the Shiu Torah? When you wanted that ring, you know that nice, beautiful ring you saw on the case on the outside, and it was so beautiful and it was so sparkling, you just had to have it, but your husband said, come on, honey, do we really need this? It's such a big expense. And you started crying like five people died until he bought it for you. Did you do the same thing when he said he doesn't want to learn Gemara anymore? When you wanted that house, that house that had to be your house, a house that was big enough to fit five of your families. And he said, honey, what do we need this for? And you gave him, a, gave him a sad face as if he just insulted your parents in public. Did you give him that same sad face when he says, I don't feel like learning today? Now, if you did that, maybe, just maybe, you did enough for today. But if you didn't even do that then what role are you playing? Are you playing the wife of him or the wife of the Satan? Now I know that some ladies are going to take offense to this, and I'm only saying this to help you, not to insult you. Your job in the world is to make sure that your husband's learned to love. Now sometimes a woman is going to listen to the Satan, who tells her, listen, as long as you're learning, it's okay if your husband doesn't learn. And sometimes you see a shiul Torah, a rabbi comes to speak, 500 women show up and six guys. Now he is here to teach the masses. He's not just teaching men and women. He has a mechitza, the men on one side, the women on the other side. But for whatever reason or another, the women have an open schedule. 500 of them show up. The guys somehow are always busy. She figures, I'm learning. It's good that you're learning, but why isn't your husband with you? Oh, he was busy. Well, do what he's doing and make sure he's not busy. It's better he goes to the shield than you. Why? He's obligated to learn. You're not obligated to learn in the same capacity. But many times women forget this. And they forget that if you watch a shield, invite your husband to watch with you. 
If you're reading a book, read the book together with your husband. In so many words, do whatever you can to get your husband to learn. Because apparently, some bad teacher along the way got him away from learning. Either because he told him that he couldn't do, he told him that he shouldn't do, or in so many ways, no one ever told him how important it is. And now the job has become yours. But if you think that you knowing the Shulchan Aruch back and forth is going to be sufficient, you're mistaken. Because your husband needs to learn. And that's why, Rabotai, this, this particular aspect of bad teacher is not necessarily always the obvious. It's not always the bad rabbi that everyone is scared of and everyone is uh, fooled by. It's not always that bad Rosh Hashiva that kicks out the kids for absolutely no good reason. Sometimes, the bad leader could literally be in the same house as a person. The bad leader could be your brother. The bad leader could be your wife. The bad leader could be your husband. The bad leader could be as close as can, as can possibly be. And the closer that bad leader is, the bigger the light that you have that he's trying to restrict. And says the Chazonish that if a person truly used is full potential, the light that they can bring into the world, the light of holiness that they can bring into the world is literally immeasurable. It's wider than the ocean. What a person does versus what he can do are worlds apart. Now, there are a couple of people that are mentioned in our Torah as truly wicked people. And the Chazoni says that the Neshama has light in it, good in it. And he's not saying the light of the righteous people. He's saying the light of people. The light of people, what's within them is good and could create an enormous amount of good if they allow it to. If it's not shut down either by themselves or by others or a combination thereof. And therefore we should be able to see this in the most wicked people too. And the Midrash Rabbah, Bereshit, Parashat Toldot, Siman 65, gives an, two examples of horrific people. Criminals, criminals against the Jewish people that gave us a perfect impression of what a light looks like when it's allowed to come out. One of them was a person by the name of Yosef Mishita. Yosef Mishita was a famous rasha, famous wicked person, evil. There was no crime he wouldn't do. And when the enemies of the Jews, the Romans, came and broke down the doors and went into the place where the Bet HaMikdash was, they got to Harabait, they were scared to enter the actual Bet HaMikdash. They've heard of the miracles. They've heard of the wonders. And they were scared of entering it themselves. And they were looking, the Midrash says, for someone to enter first, someone to be like their guinea pig. And they asked different Jews to do it, and no one would want to do it. No, 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 we're not going to the business. No. Until they found Yosef Mishita. And this Yosef Mishita says, sure, I'll go, but what's in it for me? They said, you go inside that Bet HaMikdash, and whatever you bring out is yours. Yosef Mishita said, no problem. He went inside the Bet HaMikdash, he went inside the Kodesh and surely, aside from the table and the kiol and the extraordinary things inside the Bet HaMikdash, the most apparent thing that you can see is that menorah. That menorah that's three tons of gold. And Yosef Meshita brought that menorah out, wheeling it out. And as soon as he came out, the Romans said, okay, well, you have to go again. Why? I went. 
Well, this is not something that people use. You know that. Go get something else. He goes, no, 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 I'm not going again. I'm not going again. Listen, you went it once. Just go again. Get whatever else you want. I'm not going again. Listen, Yosef, we'll give you all of the taxes that are going to be collected from the Jewish people for the next 13 years, meaning something much more valuable than what he already got. 13 years worth of taxes all goes to you. He says, I'm not going. I made my God angry once. I'm not going to do it again. What? You made your God angry once. You, the wicked person that just a moment ago didn't care to help the enemy, just a moment ago didn't see mitzvot as being part of your life or even part of your mind, you are now concerned about angering God? So of course, in the typical Roman way, these evil monsters decided to tie him up on table where they would saw the wood and they tied him up and they told me you're gonna go we're gonna saw you into pieces and he said i'm not going i ender i angered my god once i'm not gonna do it again and they started cutting him to pieces and instead of saying ow instead of saying no what yosef mishita was screaming was oi to me that i made my god angry Oi, to me that I made my God angry. This Yosef that did not care about mitzvah just a moment ago helped the enemy. Now went into the Bet Mikdash and that spark of a Jew finally came out and he didn't see anything but holiness. He didn't see anything but the fear of God. And as he's being cut to pieces, he's crying out loud that he made God angry until he died. This wicked person still had a holy neshama. Another person that Midrash brings is the nephew of Rabbi, of Rabbi Oezer. His name was uh, Yakun Ishtzorot. This Yakum Yitzchorot switched sides. Instead of being with the Jewish people, he went with the Romans. And of course, the Romans outlawed learning Torah, outlawed teaching Torah. One day, they caught Rabbi Yossi teaching Torah, and they said, okay, you're going to get a death penalty. After they tried them in their fake trials, because everyone was guilty automatically, they started taking them on the horse towards going to hang him. And as he's being brought towards the place where they're going to kill him, coming the opposite way is his nephew, who has now become one of the important people in the uh, Roman uh, government. And he stops him and he says, Oh, uncle, look at you. Look at the horse that your master, meaning Hashem, gave you. And look at the horse that my master, the Roman emperor, gave me. Your horse is bringing you death. My horse is bringing me reward. Look, I'm living life. Rabbi Yossi says to his uh, nephew, Yes, but just think about the reward that Hashem will give me versus what reward did your king give you. But this Yakum was not uh, phased by this. Reward? What reward? Heaven? Who went there and came back? He says, Ah, that doesn't face me. I have all the reward that I need. Rabbi Yossi saw that the reward doesn't work. Teaching people about reward does not work when they're in such a situation. And he says to him, if that's the case, just think about this. 
If HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the King of Kings, is punishing me for whatever sin that I made, I learned Torah, I did mitzvot, I followed the Torah, I did everything possible that it says in the Torah, and surely I've made mistakes along the way, but what mistakes did this giant tzaddik possibly make? I'll vie that our mitzvot will be like his sins. But the point is, surely everyone makes certain mistakes. He says, for whatever small mistakes that I made in my life of dedication to God, if this is what I'm getting punished with, needless to say, just imagine what the punishment is going to be for someone like you that desecrates the name of God, that has committed treason against God, that abandoned the Shabbat, that abandoned the covenant, that abandoned the Holy Torah. And that, my dear friends, worked. When Yakuma heard this, his face changed color. And he realized this is 100% the truth. If this perfect tzaddik is getting this punishment for whatever minor sin he made. What will he get for desecrating God's name? What will he get for living a life of sin? He went, the Midrash says, that spark of his neshama was now lit. There was no turning it off. He realized he has committed every sin you could possibly make. There is no longer a Sanhedrin that can give him a death penalty for it, and therefore he administered himself. But he had to administer a death penalty of every kind. You have the skila, which is the stoning. You have the fire. You have the uh, um, hanging. And you have the sword. And he set himself up. He put a tree up. He hung himself on the tree, on the bottom of the tree. He lit a bonfire, and in the, and the, and in the middle of it, there were swords. So as soon as he hung himself, the fire also burned the rope. He fell on the, uh, he fell, that's the skila, that's the stoning, and on top of the swords, in so many words, all four death penalties administered at once. When his uncle, Rabbi Yossi, is about to be hung, his holy eyes see the neshama of his nephew floating in the air with an announcement made heaven welcomes this person heaven welcomes this Yaakov Yitzchorot why? he did complete tshuva now of course no one is expected and no one is allowed to commit suicide but the point here is to show that that beautiful holy spark is in every single neshama every soul has it why is one guy focused on putting tattoos on his face and looking like a criminal and acting like a criminal while another guy is focused on tattooing his his, his mind and his soul with holy torah and doing mitzvot very simple something got in the way sometimes that something is yourself sometimes it's somebody else that's in your life the bigger the light that you can create the more you're going to have these obstacles that come in in forms of people and in forms of different uh things that happen in your life to keep that light down and the only way that you could ever get to where you want to be and where you need to be is if you overcome those obstacles because no one is going to do it for you sometimes people send messages saying listen rabbi i want to do tshuva but it's uh too expensive to live in a jewish neighborhood or rabbi listen it's a uh, i want to learn torah but i can't dedicate more than uh you know uh, maybe one hour a week or rabbi i want to convert but i uh i can't move to a jewish community can somebody else do these things for me is there an organization that's willing to pay me to move to Israel? 
is there an organization that's willing to pay me to go learn Torah so they can pay me like $10,000 a month for me to learn? Is there an organization that can simply take care of all of my problems while I become a tzaddik? No. There isn't. And you know why? Because God doesn't need you to do it. You need to do it. You say, yeah, but if God really wants me to do it, why don't he just give me $10,000 a month so I can learn Torah? Why should he give you $10,000 a month you can learn Torah if you could do for 500 bucks or 1000 bucks or $1,500 with a navrech tzaddik? Why would he pay you so much if he can get 10 people for the same price? The point is that people want somebody to do it for them. It doesn't work that way. The purpose of your life is to overcome the obstacles, to bring that light out. The more you overcome, the more light will come out. The more you expect other people to do for you, the more you yourself are keeping your light out. Says the Chazonish, there are some people that are energetic. As for these energetic ones, whose teachers have wronged them in their youth and have not raised them to labor of Torah, their excess energy will be necessarily conjured up intellectual and scientific issues in order to quench their thirst as the spirit yearns for knowledge and the pleasure of logic and thought. And since their intellect is strong and they lack the wisdom of Torah, they will invent their own thinking, a new Torah and commandments. So here the Chazonish is giving us, in essence, a warning. Some of us are above average. Most are average or below. But there are some people that are above average. Their intellect is higher. Their capacity is higher. Their energy is higher. They want to do more. They have a lot of energy. Typically, you can see this with kids. They run around. They jump around. They don't want to sleep. They don't want to follow the system. But sometimes those same kids are viewed as bad. If your kid likes to jump around, they sometimes in the schools they'll call them uh, crazy. They'll tell them that they need uh, they they have attention deficit disorder, this new sickness that was invented by lazy teachers and lazy parents. If the kid doesn't want to pay attention, like a robot, like someone that's on drugs, then uh, he must have attention deficit disorder. Oh, yeah, yeah, my, uh, you know, the kid has attention deficit disorder. Why? Well, he can't sit down in class. He's always jumping around. That's not attention deficit disorder. Oh, what is it? What is it? It's a different sickness? Yeah, it's called childhood. What? What do you mean? The, 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 the teacher said he has t- attention deficit disorder. No. The teacher maybe has attention deficit disorder. The kid is a normal kid. He just needs to find perhaps maybe a more interesting teacher or a more patient teacher, or a combination of both. But more times, more times than not, there's nothing wrong with the kid. Oh no, this one is uh, attention deficit disorder. Why? He uh, falls asleep in class. No, he doesn't have attention deficit disorder. You know what he has? He's lazy. It's also called childhood. Some of the kids are lazy. Either they're lazy because the teacher's not interesting, or they're lazy because... They simply are being distracted by other things because the parents give them video games. The parents give them all types of sports. The parents give them all types of other things that are occupying their mind. Say, Rabbi, listen, isn't it a good idea to send my kid to karate classes? Uh, Does he need to defend themselves against any terrorists? No, no, isn't it good for him to defend himself against who? Who is he defending himself with? against no in case somebody attacks him why would anybody attack him where do you live you live in a like a a terrorist camp you live in some type of like gang wars or something he's red and you're blue 
Where is he living? No, but in case some anti-Semites attack him. Uh, if an anti-Semite attacks, they usually attack with like weapons. The karate is not going to work. It's only in the movies. Oh, maybe I should send my kid to go and uh, learn how to sing. For what? Why does he need to learn how to sing? Teach him how to be a chazan. Be a cantor. He doesn't need to learn how to sing. He needs to learn how to pray. Oh, maybe my kid can go and, and learn how to be like uh, live in the, uh, in, in, in the fields, in the camping. You know, be like one of those campers. Do you live outside or do you live in a house? No, we live in a house, but just in case. In case of what? One of the movies you watch comes true and there's a war and everybody lives in the streets in little bungalows and little, little huts. What happens? Why would your kid need to know how to survive outside and how to catch some reptile and make a, I don't know, make a jacket out of him? Why would your kid need to know that? People send their kids anywhere just to keep them busy. Oh, I'm going to send my kid to go play basketball. For who? For what? Oh, it's, it's good. Maybe he's going to be good at it. Yeah, that's the problem. If he's good at it, he's going to want to do it. And he's going to spend half or more of his day chasing some basketball instead of chasing God. And the better he is at it, the worse it is. Because then he'll be accepted on a team and then he'll focus on that. When was the last time you heard of a tzaddik coming out of any of these basketball, football, baseball teams? Usually the more successful they are, the more it ruins their life. They succeed, they get a contract, they get money, with that comes the prostitutes, with that comes the drugs, with that comes the adultery, with that comes the disaster, with that comes the desecration of God's name. Oh, and you're on TV though. Is that all really all worth it? Is that really worth it? People try to get their kids to become celebrities instead of getting their kids to become simple tzaddikim, decent people. And that's the mistake sometimes of the parents. But sometimes the teachers mislead the parents by telling them that their kid is incapable. Their kid falls asleep in class. Their kid is hyperactive. You have to drug him. Don't drug your kids. You could drug the, you could drug the teacher if he wants to take it. Like this famous story that came out of Israel years ago. There was one obnoxious rabbi that had his arrogance up in the air. And he told one of the uh, kid's parents that uh, if they don't... Uh, give their kid this, uh, this drug to calm him down, he can't come back to yeshiva. And he told the teacher, listen, Rabbi, you know, he's a good kid. No, no, listen, if you don't, maybe the teach, maybe the rabbi can have a little more patience with him. No, under no condition. If he doesn't take it, he doesn't come back to yeshiva. So, they said, but yeah, but maybe he's going to be embarrassed. Now all the other kids are going to know that he's taking a, you know, this, this pill that is a, uh, you know, he's different from the other kids. So it's embarrassing him. It's embarrassing the kid in front of all of his uh, classmates. Rabbi, isn't that uh, against the Torah? So the rabbi thinks for a second, he goes, okay, you know what? Fine. What I'll do is I'll have him, I'll have him do it, you know, away from everybody. I have a plan. I'll tell him to go to bring me my coffee every day. And when he brings the coffee, he can take the pill away from everybody because he has to take it at the same time every day. So he can be away from everybody. No one's going to see him. And that way, when he comes back, no one's going to, with my coffee, no one's going to question him of what he did and where he was. Oh, thank you, Rabbi. Appreciate it. Okay. A week passes. And they see the kid is much happier. And wow, this, 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 the rabbi was right. This, this drug worked. The kid is much calmer. The rabbi is not complaining. Great. Make a call to the rabbi. Everything okay? Everything's okay? 
Okay. Another week passes, and you see the kid is still happy, everything is good, and the rabbi is not complaining. Wow, amazing. Another week passes, and now they see the kid is happier than he's ever been in his life. He's blooming. He's blooming. And no complaints from the school. And now they started questioning this. It's like a little weird. Why? Because usually this drug calms the kid down and he hasn't really calmed down. He's still jumping. He's still active. He's still doing all these things. So the father asked the kids, like, listen, so everything's good at school? He goes, yeah, yeah. It's, it's been better than ever. I love it. Oh, okay, good. The, the rabbi is still he's good with you? Yeah, he's great. It's amazing. And... You're taking you're taking the pills like uh, like 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 he said, and the kid looks at the father and goes, "Yeah, everything the rabbi told me, I'm doing." What? What do you mean? Because what do you mean everything the rabbi told you? He says, "Well, every day the rabbi tells me to go get his coffee, to put the pill in it, and I give him the pill. Ever since then, everything is good. The rabbi is good. He's healthy now." <laughs> they call the rabbi. And they said, Rabbi, so how's the kid doing? And the rabbi says, your kid is the best kid in class. He's the best kid in class. I've never seen such a good kid. And then they tell the rabbi, Rabbi, you realize what happened here? Instead of our kid taking the pill for the last three weeks, you're the one that's been taking the pill. When the rabbi realized this, obviously he stopped taking the pill, but he considered taking it. And maybe getting a prescription because you realize that the problem is perhaps not the kid. Sometimes the problem is the kid. But sometimes it's not. And the Chazoni says that if the kid is an energetic one. And you don't channel his energy. In the right direction. That energy will go somewhere. And there was one time that a Rosh Yeshiva came to get a blessing from the Chafetz Chaim. The Chafetz Chaim was like the, the grandfather of Am Yisrael. But when this Rosh Yeshiva came, as soon as the Chafetz Chaim saw him, he turned his back to him and refused to give him a blessing. Everyone saw this public embarrassment, but there's nothing that the Rosh Yeshiva can do. And he left. When the Talmidim asked, Chafetz Chaim, Kvodarav, why? I mean, there's public embarrassment. He says, don't worry about public embarrassment. That person is responsible for some of the worst crimes of the generation. You want me to make, give him a blessing? Rosh Yeshiva is responsible for crime? Had a big yeshiva, lots of students. What crimes? He says there was once a boy that came from a poor family. He was an orphan. His father died, and his poor mother was raising him. But the poor mother did not have money to pay for the yeshiva, pay for tuition. And the Rosh Yeshiva told her, if you don't come up with the money, we're going to have to throw the kid out. And she cried to him, she said, there's no way for me to come up with the money, please just let him learn. And he says, it costs us money to teach. If you don't have the money, then just send him to different school. And unfortunately, that's what happened. And that Rosh Yeshiva threw out that young boy, despite the mother, the widow's tears, despite that mother's begging for him to not do it. And that young boy had a lot of energy. That young boy had a lot of potential. That young boy had a lot of light. And instead of that light turning that young boy into one of Gdole Adol, he became one of the leaders of the communist movement, Leib Trotsky. And you want me to give that rabbi that caused Leb Trotsky to be who he is and what he is? You want me to give him a blessing? A person doesn't understand the outcome of his actions 
unless he has the fear of heaven. But sometimes a person has to be reminded. In the podcast interview last night, that was aired last night, Arya told us about a story of how when he was a young boy, he got thrown out of the yeshiva because he didn't have much money, didn't have much connections, yichus they call it. But you can't really tell people, listen, I'm going to throw you out because of money, I'm going to throw you out because you're not uh, connected to some big rabbis. Or So they blamed it on the fact that his grandmother had a TV, which obviously everyone knows is complete nonsense. Certainly, we're not advocating for anyone to have TV, but needless to say, this is not a reason to throw a kid out of a yeshiva. So you... The only hope for the kid that has TV in the house or that the grandmother has is the yeshiva. So instead of teaching him not to fall for the trap, you're in essence throwing him to the trap. What's the logic behind it? Sort of like the two rabbis that came to the Rav Steinemann and told him, listen, this young boy, he doesn't really fit in with everybody. His family, they're like, you know, they're like balet tshuva. They're not really uh, of the same caliber. Can we throw him out? Looking for the okay of the Gdola Dora of Steinemann. He says, no, you have Gaiva. You're arrogant. Why do you want to throw him out? Why? He says, I'm a Baal Tshuva. What's, the, what's wrong with the Baal Tshuva? What's wrong with him? You have Gaiva, he tells him. But unfortunately, Rav Steinemann wasn't there. He didn't know about Aryeh. Gdola Adol didn't know about Aryeh. But those rabbis knew about him. And they threw him out. After a few years of him completely becoming secular, one of the rabbis saw him. Saw him apparently living a secular lifestyle and wanted to uh, apparently stick it to him, not realizing that he's sticking the fork in his own eye. And he told him, aren't you afraid of Gehenna, the way that you're living your life? And young Arya at the time says to him, no, I'm not afraid of Gehenna because I know that you're going to be in there with me. Because you threw me out of the yeshiva when I wanted to stay. That foolish rabbi went and told the other rabbis there. And apparently one of the big leaders there knew the kid is right. He knew the kid is right. And at the moment of truth, he stood up for the truth. And he stood up and he told everyone, there's a very good chance that I lost my ulama ba because of these boys that I threw out of the yeshiva. Because you can't take it back. It's already time. It's already passed. Mistake has already been made. But apparently, that apology is very likely the reason why that rabbi had the merit to get saved when Arya did tshuva many, many years later. But how many people are like that? How many people are going to do tshuva after getting such insults? How many people are going to admit that it's really their fault? So a person needs to know that your Judaism is not defined by other people's perception of you. Your Judaism is not something that anyone can take away from you, aside from you taking it from yourself. If you want to live a righteous life, whether Jew or Gentile, it's in your hands, nobody else's. You can't use anyone as an excuse, and you can't blame anyone but yourself. Even if you have some bad teachers that fool you, cheat you, and mislead you. But needless to say, if a person does fall for those traps, fall for those obstacles of the Satan, whoever is a tool that the Satan uses, whatever bad teacher, whatever bad rabbi, whatever bad parent even, will also get punished. But that's not going to bring anyone to heaven. That just increases the number of casualties. So the Chazonish says, that those energetic ones 
whose teachers have wronged them and have not raised them to labor in Torah, their excess energy will be used for something else. And since their intellect is strong and they lack the wisdom of Torah, they will invent their own thinking, their own Torah. According to their thinking, these are the commandments and this is the Torah. And they are extremely happy for having merited to enlighten others with their Torah, meaning their new version of the Torah. But the truth of the light of the Torah cannot be perceived by mere musings, rather only by those who labor in it and taste its sweetness. And the greater the person's special talents, the greater the loss when he remains outside of the study hall of the Talmud. For there is nothing greater than the study of Talmud. And not only has he robbed himself of wisdom and knowledge, he has robbed his generation of a wise and understanding person, but he also brings wrong ideas and false teachings into the world and goes on to teach them to his students, causing them to forget the Torah and to go off the straight path. Here, the Chazonish tells us the development of what happens to a person who has an extraordinary light in him and each and every single one of us has that light. Some have bigger than others, but needless to say, everyone's light is wider than the ocean. Everyone can do much more extraordinary things than they could possibly imagine. But there are some that are even an exception to that. They're given certain gifts. They're geniuses. They're unique. While everyone has enormous potential, enormous abilities, far more than they can imagine. Yes, you that plays video games for five hours a day, you have huge potential. Yes, you that has a problem with even wearing modest clothes, you have enormous potential. Yes, you that has been stealing from his customers for the last 10 years, enormous potential. Yes, you that has never read a complete book from, you know, from cover to cover, you have enormous potential. Some of my students, Baruch Hashem, that have literally completed chess, when I first met them, they never read a single book. Some of my Talmudim that literally have become extraordinarily righteous people, Whenever good students, whenever much of anything, but they became something after they got into the Torah. Everyone has enormous potential. And even in that world, once you allow that light to come out, some have even brighter light than others. They were born with certain gifts. And whoever turned off that gift needs to know they didn't turn off the light. It's simply they channel that light to its different direction. And that light will be spent somewhere else, some other science, some other intellectual endeavor. And that's where you see many times the extraordinary successful CEOs, extraordinarily successful executives, extraordinarily successful scientists, engineers, doctors, lawyers, all types of media. Many times you see them, Jews, that are the children of religious parents, sometimes even the children of rabbis or grandkids of big rabbis. Those kids grew up. That light is still there. But instead of being channeled to its good, instead of being channeled to its holiness, instead of being channeled to create more beauty in the world, more good in the world, more holiness in the world, is now being channeled into something else. Sometimes that something else is evil. Sometimes that something else is good, but not their purpose. They're good at being a doctor, but that's not their purpose. They're good at being an executive, developing new ideas, but that's not their purpose. And unfortunately, that light that was supposed to bring 
thousands and thousands of Jews back to Hashem. That light that was supposed to be utilized to sanctify God's name more than anybody else does in that generation is utilized to sanctify the internet, to sanctify their bank account, to sanctify their perversions, to sanctify all types of crazy things, but only sanctify them in their own mind because it becomes their own Torah, but not a good Torah, just a Torah in their mind, something that they hold valuable. Many times, that could have been different. Many times, somebody got in the way. There was one time where a parent walked next to me as I was going to shul, and uh, he was crying to me about his son. How his son is not keeping to line mitzvot. I said, yeah, but why don't you send him to yeshiva? He said, no, I tried. I said, okay, so what happened? He said that they, they didn't accept him because I didn't have enough money. And uh, they, you know, the, uh, they told me not to... Uh, that I can't send him there. I said, yeah, but you live, you live here. You live in a community where there's a lot of people that have money. Why don't you ask anybody? He said, I asked the rabbi. And the rabbi himself told me, send him to public school. That was the beginning of the end of my relationship with that community. Let's just say that. When I realized there's something wrong here. As I investigated, I saw that it wasn't a fake story, and unfortunately, it wasn't the only story. These types of stories are everywhere, but guess what? Even though somebody got in the way, even though the rabbi was bad, even though the community didn't help, when you go up to Shemaim, you can't really use those excuses as why you lived your entire life a life of sin. Because just like you learned, how to be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer or a programmer or developer or whatever, a rocket scientist. You're also able to learn the purpose of life. Yes, you had an obstacle in your way. Yes, you had a bad teacher in your way. But that didn't stop you from succeeding in many other things. So yes, the teacher and the rabbi and whoever else got in the way and, and caused you trauma and caused you hardship is going to get punished. But that does not mean that you're going to go to heaven for living a life full of sins. For some reason, people think that just because somebody doesn't kill people, that means they're going to go to heaven. Oh, he's a tinok shenishba. They use this, this misguided understanding of what a captured baby is in halachic terms to make people think that it's okay that people are secular. Oh no, he lived, he grew up in a secular house, so he's a tinok shenishba. Oh, he grew up, uh, you know, he grew up with uh, no uh, no local yeshiva, so he's a tinok shenishba. Oh, he lived in, uh, you know, in a secular community, so he's a tinok shenishba. Everybody's a, everybody's a tinok shenishba. Tinok shenishba means captured baby. Now, even if you want to say that he's a tinok shenishba, he's a captured baby, even though Rav Avadya, Rav Yashiv, and... The overwhelming majority of Gdolea Ado will agree, disagree with you according to pretty much almost all opinions. Even the most lenient ones are going to disagree with you. But even if they agree with you, even if you'll find somebody that agrees with you, if you ever saw a captured baby, would you just say, oh, he's a captured baby, he's a captured baby, and just walk away? No, free the baby. Okay, you see him, he's clueless about Judaism, he's clueless about the truth. Free him, teach him. Why are you leaving him captured? Why do you tell him it's okay to drive the shul on Shabbat? Why do you tell him it's, uh, it's okay that he's married to a non-Jew? Like, free the baby. Free the guy that doesn't know anything. Why are you leaving him captured? And even if you say, well, I don't know how to free him. I don't know how to free him. Or it's not my responsibility to free him. All types of other incorrect conclusions that people come to. You have to understand Tinok Shenishba is not a halachic term that means that whoever doesn't know 
because of some circumstance is simply going to go to heaven anyway. No one in the world ever says that. All Tinok Shenishba means is simply that the way you treat him in this world, where if he is a Tinok Shenishba, let's say he doesn't even know that he's Jewish, and you found out he's Jewish, and he touches your wine, that's lo mevushal. Now, obviously, if he doesn't know he's Jewish, he's desecrating Shabbat. If a non-Jew that's you know is, touches your wine that's not mevushal, you have to throw out the wine. If a Jew that desecrates Shabbat on purpose touches your wine, you have to throw out the wine. But if a tinok shenishba touches your wine, you don't throw out the wine. That's it. That's all it means. It doesn't mean that just because he doesn't know, he goes to heaven anyway with Moshe Rabbeinu and Rabbi Akiva. All it means is how you treat him Allah clean this world. That's it. But for some reason, the public has been misled to believe that since we live in a generation where a lot of people are ignorant, therefore Hashem is simply just going to decide to put everyone in heaven. Guess what? If you put everyone in heaven, it's going to turn into Gehenom. If you put all of the Reshaim, all of the Mechal Shabbat, all of the people that are boiling Nidot, all of the people that are desecrating God's name on a regular basis in heaven, it turns into Gehenom. All of the Tzadikim will leave heaven and go to Gehenom instead. Because at least over there, they're being rectified. There is no such thing as someone that is not observing Torah and Mitzvot going to heaven. There's no such thing. There's no reality like that. The stories that were mentioned in the Midrash earlier of these exceptional stories, these exceptional neshamot that rectified themselves through the death penalty and so on, it doesn't mean that they go to heaven forever and they live uh, pleasantly. Simply meant that they don't have to suffer in Gehenom. They have done their tikkun, if you will. But in order for them to earn a place in heaven and, and, and live a wonderful life and so on forever, they have to still fulfill the mitzvot. Either way, no one is doing anything remotely close to what uh, Rabbi Dordia did or any of these uh, Yosef Meshita did or anybody else. The point being is, is that a person needs to know that you have a light in you that gives you the potential and ability to do extraordinary things. There are going to be obstacles in your way. Without a doubt, people will get in your way. In fact, the bigger the light, the bigger the obstacles. The bigger your potential to create good in the world, the bigger the possibility that even the rabbi that's local to you will be your enemy, that even your parents may say that you shouldn't be doing what you're doing, even though you're going on the righteous path, that some of your friends will turn into enemies. Why? Because the Satan has many soldiers, and he's going to use all of them to get in your way. Now, when a person understands the value of what can be done if you actually take the advantage of that light, they'd never even look at sin twice. Years ago, Rabbi Yashiv told his goodbye that he wants to go visit a young man that uh, got injured pretty badly. And he went to visit. And anyone that knows a little bit about Ravel Yashiv, Ravel Yashiv was very particular about how he used his time. But in this particular case, he was visiting a Talmud Chacham. And he spent an hour with him. Talking to him, Divre Torah. Now after, after this, Talmud of Rabbi Yashiv asked him, Kvod Rav, uh, why did you spend so much time with this young man? He says to him, do you know how he injured himself? He injured himself because he was learning Torah in a Bet Midrash. 
and he needed another book. And that book was on top of everything else. So he had to climb one of these big ladders to go up to the ceiling. So he, this walk-up ladder, he woke up to the ladder, and he didn't want to waste a single moment. As soon as he got to the book, he started reading it. And he got so deep into the Torah within a moment that he forgot that he's two stories up on a ladder. And he walked off the ladder as if he was still downstairs. And he fell down and broke his bones. Anyone that can go so deep into the Torah that he forgets that he's two stories high in the air is someone that is certainly good for us to spend an hour with. Years later, that someone became the Rishon Letzion, Rav Ovadi Yosef. Rav Yashiv already knew at that time that this young man is going to be a Gadol. And they were very friendly throughout, from that point on, for many, many years. Recently, Rabbi Yitzhak Yosef, in his weekly shiu, hosted for the yard site of uh, Rav Yashiv, he, uh, his, uh, the son of Rav Yashiv came and spoke and both Rabbi Tzak Yosef uh, and uh, uh, Rabbi Yashiv's son, both extraordinary Talmidei Chachamim, both are sharing family stories because the families have been so close for so many years. And it's beautiful to see how one Gadol was able to recognize another Gadol before anybody else can. One light was able to see another. When a person understands that what you have, what you've already been given, could literally make you a lot more successful than you can possibly imagine, then it becomes easier to understand why the punishment for not doing it is so heavy. Because as the Chazoni says, by not going after that light, by not taking advantage of that light that Hashem gave you, by not going to learn the Talmud, by not going to learn the Holy Torah, by not going to take advantage of literally a direct connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and allowing that light to come out, you're not only robbing yourself, of, what, of knowledge and wisdom, but you're actually robbing the entire generation of a Talmud Chacham. You're robbing the entire generation of that wisdom. And if it's a really big light that's within you, you're not only robbing the generation of that wisdom, but if you had the potential to be a Gadol Adol, if you had the ability, the light, to be a giant, that means that you will use that light for horrible things, for things that are the opposite of truth. And that's where it gets really ugly. The, the head of the some of the most vile Jewish personalities in the last couple of hundred years was a Talmud Yeshiva, Leib Trotsky. Some of the heads of some of the most vile things in the last couple of hundred years, whether it's Marx or some of the other horrible people that the world uses as an excuse, as a pretext to hate Jews, some of them were Talmud Yeshiva. Marx wasn't, but uh, at least not to my knowledge. But the point is, some of those people were Talmud Yeshiva. Some of them weren't, but needless to say, each one of them had the same ability, or if not more, to do just as much good as they did evil. But the Satan fooled them and anyone around them to make them think that they're going in a better path. And Chazonish is saying that whoever was involved, whoever was responsible, whoever was a partner in destroying those neshamot will have a price to pay because they didn't just 
rob that person of eternity, of heaven. They robbed an entire generation. Now, the average person, when you ask them, you know, what blessing do they want? Usually people ask for money or they ask for a lot of things. In the Birkot HaShachar, we say, you know, the morning blessings, we thank Hashem for giving us everything. Shasali kol tzorki. Rabbi Tzach Yosef, in the Yalkut Yosef Siman 46, uh, Al-Khan number 39, he says in the name of the sages that this blessing that is saying that God made me everything is specifically referring to shoes. If you have shoes to wear, Hashem gave you everything that you need. Now the average person in the world looks at this like, what? What do you mean? Isn't he referring to the body? Isn't he referring to the eyes? Isn't he referring to the soul? No, no, he's referring to shoes. Why? Because the other parts of your, the gifts that Hashem gave you, that you're supposed to thank Him for every morning, you already blessed those. You already thanked Him for it. When it says, Sali Kotsoki, that thank you Hashem for giving me everything, it's actually referring to shoes. Thank you, Hashem, for giving me shoes. But you don't say, thank you, Hashem, for giving me shoes. You say, Shasali Kotsoki, that he gave me everything I need. Why everything? Why is the shoes considered everything that I need? Because once a person has shoes, that means that they have the ability to do whatever it is they need to do. You need to go to shul, you need to go to the Bet Midrash, you need to go serve Hashem, you need to go to work. Wherever you need to go, you can do it. In so many words, you have everything you need to reach your full potential if you simply have shoes on. So don't cry and say, no, no, I can't reach my full potential if I don't have uh, this amount of money. I can't reach my full potential if I don't live in this community. I can't reach my full potential if I don't have such and such. No, no, no. You have shoes. That means you have everything you need to reach your full potential. Surely it seems like it would be easier if you had more money, if you had a better community, if you had this and if you had that. Sure, you're right. It would be better, theoretically speaking, but apparently it wouldn't be. How do I know it wouldn't be? Because if you don't have it, that means Ribbono Olam, the master of the world, decided that you don't need it right now. Right now, you have everything you need. Tomorrow you may need something else. Next week you may need something else. A year from now you may need something else. But don't worry about a year from now. Worry about today. Because if he gave you what you needed today, and you used what you have today, like you're supposed to, surely he will give you what you need a year from now when you need more. But if you worry so much about the future, and what you're going to need in the future, then that means that you're never going to act on today. You're never going to do what you need to do today. And you're never going to reach that light. It's important for a person to understand. If you have shoes, you have the ability, you have the tools to fulfill your potential. And therefore you bless Hashem, thank you for giving me everything I need. If you truly mean that, when you say your morning blessings, that means that today, you're going to do the best you possibly can to reach your full potential today. Don't worry about tomorrow or next year or 500 years from now. Worry about today. And when that obstacle comes in your way, whether that obstacle is a long-bearded person that calls himself rabbi or some other superstar type of person or some wicked person or some drug dealer or some woman that you're not supposed to look at or some this or some that. When all of those different obstacles come in your way and tell you, why are you doing this? Don't do this. Don't do that. Do something else. Always remember, 
I have shoes on. I have the tools to do everything I need to do to reach my potential right now. And I only have this one obstacle in front of me, whether it be these bad teacher or bad person or bad obstacle. That's the only thing that's in front of me to reach my full potential. That's it. Don't worry about the obstacles of next week and next year and next century. The obstacles of today is only what's in front of you. If you could reach your full potential today, certainly you could reach your full potential tomorrow. And if you could reach your full potential tomorrow, certainly you could reach your full potential the next day. And on and on and on. But if you burn your days and waste your time with all types of video games and all types of waste of life conversations and all types of waste of life meetings and all types of waste of life sleeping, then you're simply wasting your life and you're allowing the obstacles to simply become your life. And when you go up to Shemaim and they ask you, why did you live such a life that didn't reach your full potential? And you're going to ask him, what was my full potential? And they're going to show you that you had the potential to be the most righteous person in a generation. The biggest scholar in a generation. The most extraordinary rabbitsin, a rabbinit in a generation. You had the ability to be a woman that not only was righteous herself, knowledgeable herself, modest herself, but also brings, brings the next generation of righteous people to the world. But instead of bringing those next generation of Ravavadyas and Stipler Gaons to the generation, you're focusing on corporate America to build your, uh, your resume to be a CEO of some publicly traded company one day. You are too concerned about your husband being rich enough to make sure before you have kids. So therefore, you didn't get married until you got married until you became rich you worried about all the wrong things instead of fulfilling your full potential now many times the satan will come to you and tell you yeah but there's so many obstacles he's a liar how do i know because usually all you have is the obstacles of today yeah but next week i have a lawsuit Next week is a long time from now. Yeah, but 90 days from now, I need to move. Ooh, 90 days. That's like, that's like a century. Might as well be a century. No, but next year, I need to go there. Next year? Do you know how long next year is? Do you know how long next year? you know how much you can do in a year? You could literally build a country in a year. People are worried about things that will happen down the road. Worry about today, mommy. Worry about today. Worry about today. F fulfill your purpose today. Do your homework today. Fulfill your potential today. Learn today. Do today. You're worried about next week. Who gave you a guarantee you're going to live till next week? Who says this problem will exist next week? Who says that next year the circumstances will not change? You know how long that is a year from now? It's a long time a year. Don't worry about a year or even a week. Worry about today. Today, you have an opportunity to bring out that light. To bring out that light that you have inside you and let it come outside and play once. Play with the beautiful world that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created. Let that light learn some Torah. Let that light live with the Torah. Let that light come out. Not to play video games and chase after all types of people. And chase after all types of immorality. Let that light unify with its creator. Today. Tomorrow. Ooh, it's a long time from now. But if you get there. After you have so much fun today. You're going to want to do it tomorrow too. But don't think that just because you did it good today. And the Satan fell flat on his back today. 
He won't get up to stop you again tomorrow. In fact, he's very likely to bring some new weapons tomorrow. Today he brought you some bad video that confused you. Tomorrow he'll actually bring you the bad people to confuse you. Today he brought you the bad phone call. Tomorrow he may bring you a bad email. Every day he's going to bring something. But don't get mad at him. That's his job. Your job is to bring out that holy light that's within you to fulfill its potential. If you're a married woman, priority in your life is to fulfill the mitzvot yourself, be a modest woman, cover your hair, cover your body, make sure you have, you build a kosher home, you have a husband, make sure he's learning Torah, you have kids, make sure they're learning Torah. Before you worry about your own scholarship and you worry about anything else in the world and what your girlfriends are doing down the street and what your grandmother is doing in a different country, make sure that your own house is in order. If you're a man, make sure that you're learning Torah. Certainly you need to make a living. Certainly you need to make sure that there's food on the table. But who's the one that gives you the food? Who's the one that gives you the job? It's the same one, and one and only, that tells you you have to learn Torah. Where he says, Im lo lo samti. If not for my covenant, day and night, the rules of the world will cease to exist. The rule that your job is supposed to pay you on time will cease to exist. The rule that your customers will pay will cease to exist. The rule that the opposite party that's supposed to be your partner will not sue you will cease to exist. All types of things cease to exist when Hashem doesn't see enough Torah. Once you learn Torah, then you see how the world is supposed to work. And Satan will try to make you think that it's other ways. So to make you think that, no, no, if you learn Torah, you're not going to have time to work. If you learn Torah, you're not going to have time to eat. If you learn Torah, you're not going to have time to uh, be with your kids. You're not going to have time to be with your wife. You're not going to have time to do a lot of things. It's all a lie. The more you learn Torah, the more you'll find time to do all the other things. Why? Because once you bring more of that supernatural light into the world, the natural becomes less relevant to you. 90 days to a person without light seems like it's tomorrow. To someone that has a little light, literally like 90 miles away 90 years away 90 light years away it's all this it's just so far it's just so far why because how much can you accomplish in one day one day you could accomplish so much use that light and don't let anyone else get in the way even if they say they mean well you have the Torah which is the instruction set of how to fulfill your purpose in light, in life. And part of that purpose is bringing out that light, that light that is literally wider than the ocean. Thank you for learning with me. May Hashem bless each and every single one of you to have the courage, the wherewithal, and the audacity to bring out that light and never shut down anybody else's light. We'll speak to each other and learn again later this week. In the beginning, you know, I figured I can't find a job. I'm going to try to open another business. So I went from one deal, a different deal. I made a couple of very bad deals. Lost a lot of money. After a year or so, I went to my accountant and I asked him to add up all the money that I worked on Shabbos over the last few years that I made them profit. Compare it to my losses from the funds from selling that business. And it was, we're talking it in the thousands of dollars, in the heavy thousand. And it was almost to the penny. Hashem took back everything I earned on Shabbos. He took it back by the investments. It was a great comfort for me. What gave you that idea to ask your accountant for that? Maybe I wrote a room in video, Hashem took back his millions.